everybody welcome to smooth finish if you've never joined us before and hopefully you got a lot of new listeners this time uh this is this is uh episode three of an education series that the npc is putting out this one's a little extra special because we are taking basically our flagship education that we've brought to the industry and we want to take it to that consumer level let them uh, get their hands on it because the topic today is very very important it's really the genesis of uh, for us, anyway, plaster and the swimming pool. And that's what we're going to talk about. First, let me introduce my co-host and our guest. And that would be Mr. Chris Marcano. Hey, Chris. Hello, everybody. It's great to be here once again for the feel-good edition of Smooth Finish. Uh, and Mr. Rob Romano, welcome. Hey, guys. Good to be back. Looking for another good talk. And we have Mr. Kent Westfalls, who our Director of Technical Services at the NPC. He's going to join and uh, drop some knowledge throughout the call to us today. Hello, everybody. Awesome, Glad to be back. This is a good topic. Well, great. Well, one thing I want to yes. Yeah, it's a great topic, important to us for sure. Um, so this is, this is our podcast. And, and just so everybody knows, we have platforms. You can find us on Facebook. You can find us on Twitter. Um, all the other <laughs> platforms out there, obviously our podcast here can be found on any of the, the normal stations you can get them on. Um, so our campaign again is we want to get this, what to us is a, a good piece of information. It's our startup card. This is a second edition. We want to get it out to the world so that they can understand uh, the importance of this, the proper startup of a swimming pool. And, you know, and that that's in relation to quite a few things. And mainly I think to the homeowners listening, you know, kind of the aesthetic right up front and for the life of your pool, the functionality and, and really the lifespan, how long this plaster going to last you. And interesting enough, those first 28 days and really like the first few weeks are so vitally important to, to, to get it right. So we uh, also, just so all are aware, we have a certification class that's been out there for a while. This new is going to be out, just a little bit of updating. And this education we're, we're sharing with the world uh, is going to be the pla a, a platform for startups for several apprenticeship programs that are coming out right now um, and also and just required curriculum uh, in the pool industry. So we're very excited about that, that it, that it has had impact and it does make sense to our peers. So that being said, let's go ahead and uh, get into this, guys. Let's share with the world, uh, you know. What's important about the startup? Why? And uh, what you guys kind of take it? Yeah. Well, you, yeah, I, I guess just to jump in here, it, it's it's really a simple, simple proclamation here. And, and Ken, with, with all of your years, you know, of experience and the 26 years you've worked with Pebble Tech specifically, um, why is it that startup is so important? Like, let's just start there. Well, it's important for a couple of reasons. Uh, if you want the aesthetics that you signed up for to remain in the finish, it, it, your startup is very important in that fact. Also for the longevity of your finish. Um, if the startup is done incorrectly, it can also affect the longevity of your surface. And uh, that's not uncommon. So it, it is very important that somebody who's very knowledgeable uh, does these startups for these uh, clients that have the pools that have just freshly been plastered. So when you say aesthetics, I mean, obviously every homeowner, every, every uh, pool builder wants to deliver a consistent quality product and the homeowner wants that specific look. We've all seen it. We've all done with it. There's apps now. There's catalogs. You want that finish that way with that sparkle and that color. Um, can it, I, I guess because of a poor startup application, a poor startup process, how quickly can that aesthetically go south? How, how, how fast can it turn? <clears throat> Quicker than most people realize, if you're not addressing the high pH, you're going to get scale buildup uh, that can damage not only uh, the finish, but it can affect your tile and it can affect your equipment. Um, I've seen pieces of equipment that have been cut open, specifically a heater that had calcium buildup on the inside of the 
plumbing and uh, it doesn't take that long when the pH is that high. And during a startup, the pH continues to rise and that's part of the uh, startup procedures that we talk about in our, in our class is that you're going to have to address the pH um, again and again and again because in, in the hydration of cement, uh, you're going to see the pH go up because it releases calcium hydroxide and that will drive the pH up. You have to keep working it down. And we also don't want people to try and do it in one fell swoop. You have to do it in small adjustments. Yeah, yeah. So so essentially, specific, specifically with the pH piece, it's much better to be very proactive as, as, as the pool is being started uh, in, in frequent testing, frequent treatment, and not necessarily, oh, I'll go dip a strip in once a week, and if I need to, I'll slug some acid in there. But, you right? know, th- th- this is Rob. So I, I think... When I when I approach a, a new client uh, and explain what's going to happen with the new finish, right? So here's setting expectations going forward after you fill the pool up. You know everything goes in perfectly, and then you add water. And when you add water, it changes that it changes everything. You 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 um, the water that you're adding has a certain chemistry, and it's really important to understand where that starts out um, and how to adjust it to get the water into balance. One of the things that I try, I explain to the homeowners, you know, here's the properties of plaster or a cement finish. Um, and one of them is that the, the pH on the wall, and correct me if I'm wrong, I get the number, it's like over 12, right? So you know, all of that is, it's, the pH is so high, it's, it's driving the pH of the water up. And what happens when the pH of the water is too high, it, the, 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 uh, the calcium carbonate that's in there has to go somewhere. It spills out. I, I, I kind of equate it to like um, to uh, a snowfall. It's going to snow on your finish and it like gives it a nice blank, especially colored finishes, nice coating of, 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 um, of a, a white uh, calcium that can come off. But, you know, it's 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 a byproduct of the pH and the alkalinity being too high. Uh, one, and once people understand that, they've got a starting point and know where to fight it. You know, so if you're uh, in, in constantly testing the chemicals and constantly brushing the pool walls and making sure that, that your pH and alkalinity are in, in the very early uh, onset of the, of the finish is, is low. And, and truth be told, that's a battle that they're going to fight for not just the first 30 days. They're going to they're gonna have that fight for 60, 90, maybe 120 days for, the, for at least the summer. Um, so they have... Arming that with that information and, and setting that expectation, I think, is so important up front so that they don't call you or call me up. And this is this is what it is. It's preventive maintenance on my end. They, so they don't call me up and say, Rob, your finish is losing its pigment. It's like, no, it's not losing pigment. It's getting the, the scale Absolutely. is happening, is, is forming, and here's why. Um, uh, you know, of course, calcium hardness falls a big play into that. And you want to get that up, up uh, over 150, 200 parts per million. Um, and make sure that, in, that that's that's all set so it doesn't do the opposite instead of scaling on the pool it pulls it out but um, I mean hopefully I'm not getting ahead of myself or, or, ourselves here but I, I think those those setting that expectation to the homeowner and they understanding what it is that they're up against is so important in the sales process and it all begins there uh, and, and then they know how to how to combat it you know having that uh, uh, the, uh, the startup card, is very helpful too. Uh, so it gives them anybody, whether homeowner or service company, gives you that that guidance on on how to take care of the pool. Yeah, and, and the startup card that Rob mentioned is is a great, invaluable tool because it is <clears throat> the pinnacle of procedural steps in the industry across our, the board of the 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 right way to do this, to set yourself up for success. So this is the, the way to do it. And it's available at nationalplasterscouncil.com uh, for both consumers and non-members, and you can download it there. And it is an invaluable um, asset and resource when it comes to these startups the right way. But so I know, Rob, you'd mentioned calcium hardness, but let, let's kind of, before we, we, we kind of go to these different points and the, the different uh, parameters of, of chemistry, um, it, let's kind of sum up to what Kent alluded to or began talking about with the pH rise that we can anticipate 
uh, which does need to be checked very frequently due to the uh, the issues with a, a new a new surface and the creation of calcium hydroxide. Um, how does brushing um, factor into that, in your opinion, Kent? It's extremely important. Um, if you've ever looked at a smooth plaster finish, it looks smooth. But if you look at a magnified photo of it, it looks like the surface of the moon because there's all these little holes and crevices that are there. It's just, it's, you, you can only do so much with a, with a troweling and, um, these little crevices will collect dust, dirt. And even after the startup is quote unquote completed, brushing still remains very, very important because you will start to get surface staining if you do not brush that pool. So it's important that that whoever is servicing the pool, uh, whether it's during the startup or afterwards, that they do that brushing. It's very important. If you do not brush it early on, you will get scale buildup on the surface of the finish and it will become rough. And then the aesthetics get affected because as Rob was alluding to, you get the masking of the pigment because that calcium covers it up. And once that calcium hydroxide sticks, it starts to become, it, it turns into calcium carbonate, and it's much harder to remove at that point. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, another issue that we want to bring up, too, is the importance of uh, full-time or, or proper water circulation. So many folks out there are just programmed now and used to, you know, only running their pool X amount of hours a day. Personally, and, you know, Coming from the Midwest, you turn your pump on when you open the pool and you turn it off when you close it. That's kind of just how it works. Um, but a lot of markets aren't don't subscribe to that train of thought. So uh, let's talk about a little bit how important it is and what we should kind of have as a minimum requirement for proper circulation during the startup process. Bare minimum is the first 72 hours. You have to do it. And the thing that, that people don't realize is that the circulation is almost as important as the brushing and the adjusting of the chemicals. Because if you put a sequestrant in, you want to get filtered out. You can't filter it out unless you're running the pump. Now, some people object to it because they don't have a variable speed pump, but that is slowly turning the corner. People are now being required to yep. put in the variable speeds, which... They're a very useful tool. Um, I think it's a, a game changer for our industry, actually. I agree. Uh, the, the circulation, I, I've seen pools uh, that I have done inspections on where I walk up and the pool has sat stagnant for three weeks. <laughs> yeah. nothing, has, nothing has been done. So mm -hmm. I take some pictures and there's, there's calcium crystals that look like snowflakes all over the surface. So circulation is, is uh, it's right up there in importance. It, it needs to be done. Um, if you're just brushing, what you're doing is you're elevating the, the calcium off the floor and off the walls, and it has to be pulled through the filter, and that's not going to happen unless it's being circulated. Now, if you brush back it, you can probably get away with a little bit less filtration time, but I don't recommend it. it, it it's always good at least for the first 72 hours. Uh, when you get down to where you've been on it for two weeks, um, you're brushing it, say, once a day, you could probably cut down on the circulation time. And every industry or every area, geographic area, is going to be a little bit different as to runtime. Yeah. Uh, runtime is also important when it comes to sanitation. So. Oh, absolutely. And, and you mentioned it too. You brought up the, the use of a quality sequestering agent. And I'm going to stress that quality, you know, do your homework. There's, there's many companies that make many fine products, but there's also some products out there that just aren't that effective, like anything out, you know, in any market. But um, I will say, and this is kind of my, in my wheelhouse, when you're adding any type of sequestering and or chelating agent, uh, it's imperative that you add it with the pump and filter running because the the interaction between the molecules and the, and the stuff, you know, uh, that's in the water that we're trying to interact with by adding a sequestering or chelating agent, it actually likes to have some shear movement. So the water needs to be running. Sometimes you have to have contact 
uh, in the, that occurs in the filter that can also expedite or create a little bit of, of uh, attraction with those molecules. You get more agglomeration that way. So um, it's just a good rule of thumb. Anytime you add a specialty chemical like that, that you follow the instructions, and I'm going to tell you right now, they're going to tell you to add it while the pump and filter are on and the water is moving in a specific way. So yes, do not just dump in something and walk away, you know, and especially if the water is not moving. Um, I, uh, one thing about sequestrants that seems to be forgotten is that it doesn't last forever. And if you're going to use a sequestrant, it, if you read the instructions, as you pointed out, they're going to recommend that you continue to use it, especially if you're going to have an issue with metals in the water, because as your fill water comes in, it's adding more and more metals. So your sequestrant is going to get oxidized by the chlorine and also by the sunlight. So you have to add it on a, um, a program a scheduled program, so much a month, so much a week, whatever it is the manufacturer recommends, that needs to be followed. Otherwise, you're going to have an issue. Yeah, and, and homeowner, builder, applicator alike, whoever is, is basically going to be the one that, that is um, concerned about the appearance of that, that particular swimming pool, you're exactly right, Kent. It's, it's, there's a startup process typically for these type of products that lead to a maintenance program. And, and that's not, you know, trying to sell you anything. It's just the, the, the science of it. When right. you apply a lot of these products, they do oxidize once over prolonged exposure to, to oxidizers and different halogens like chlorine, like, you know, even ozone, UV, diff, different type of systems, um, alternative sanitizer systems as well, but also just exposure to the sun. Um, UV degrades, some of the, the components of these down and they essentially break up into inert material. So they're designed to be added in a frequency and will help protect against the problems that can arise from trace metals, including excessive calcium. So it's, it's a pretty simple process and it's very cheap insurance to it keep is. and maintain that, that, that appearance of the pool. So think of it almost like, um, you know, whitening toothpaste, right? It's like, do you want just regular toothpaste or do you want to use the whitening toothpaste? Cause it's going to keep your smile a little bit brighter just by using it, you know, every so often. So, uh, anyway, off my soapbox there about specialty <laughs> chemicals and sequestering. <laughs> um, but it is important though, that, that people, you know, apply, if you're going to use it, don't just throw it in there and say, okay, it's good now. There, there is a process like anything and it does need to be reapplied. Um, so another thing that I, I know this gets asked a lot uh, across the board is when is the right time to add chlorine, to shock the pool? Or even more importantly now with the popularity, obviously, and, and the rise uh, of installations of salt systems, of chlorine generators, uh, what, how, how do we best approach that? Well, I have so, an opinion on that. <laughs> I'll, 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 I can't answer it. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Um, it's salt is, is uh, something that has been, uh, if, if you have a, a product that has been outrageously successful, I would look at a salt system. It, it just took the industry by storm. And what you have to remember with, with salt is that it, it, uh, interrupts the hydration of the uh, cement and it, it actually cuts down on the carbonation. So it's, it's recommended that you wait 30 days to put that in. Salt is, um, it, it's beneficial um, as a chlorine source for a service company because they don't have to go out and buy it, transport it, store it, handle it. Um, so that's the benefit, but there's also some downsides to them and, and people need to research it before they go ahead and move forward with it. Um, on the addition of chlorine, I'll be the, I'll be the voice of experience here. Um, please. I had a lady that had a pool that she wanted to open up for her son's birthday. And I knew there was metal in the water. I knew it because the water filled the pool up and it was, it was clear, but it was green and you had uh, iron in it and <laughs> I put a little too much chlorine in to get it ready. It oxidized that metal and guess what? We had stains 
we were able to remove the stains without having to drain the pool, but that's what can happen. If you, if you super chlorinate a pool that has metal in the fill water, it's going to oxidize and then it will stick. And that can be a real problem to remove depending on the, the size of the uh, pool and the extent of the oxidation that occurred. That so, goes back to testing your fill water, making sure you know what's in that water, whether you're filling great it by, a hose or by a truck or whatever. Understand your fill water. That's going to set all the parameters um, for balancing the pool properly um, once it's full. Um, you know, I, if, I, if I may, on, on the salt end of things, I know the official recommendation is, is 30 days. I, we've found as a company that 60 to 90 or even holding off for a year, especially up here in the northeast, in, in, in the northern climates, you have, you have to put the pools uh, down for the winter, winterize. Um, they don't work below 50 degrees. So the byproduct of salt yeah. is a high yeah. pH. And we've talked a lot about right. keeping the pH low. If you're a homeowner and you don't, you've already, you would already struggle with keeping the pH at a, at a normal, heck, even service companies have struggled keeping the pH down. Okay. Cause you have to babysit the pool for a while. Uh, and then you add that, you have that added influence from the salt, uh, I, I have gone to pools that are two months old that look like they're 30 years old because they just played it out from too, too much uh, uh, with, with, from neglect from keeping the pH in, in, in check. So, the thing so that- Rob, Rob Kent, so basically we're playing with fire here potentially if you're going about a new a new applicant, you know, a freshly applied uh, plaster finished pool, fresh fill and Obviously, because of the curing process with calcium hydroxide, that's going to drive the pH. But if we also add to that equation prematurely, I'll say, turning on a, a, a chlorine generator and, and with that process also driving up the pH, we've got two factors that are essentially supercharging the pH straight up. Yes. So it becomes a major issue as opposed to a significant issue. Once the finish cures out, or I should say hydrates out, and all of that, that part of it has, has settled down where it's ra- raising the pH. Salt is great. I have no problem putting salt in the pool. Uh, but you do want to be careful with um, your timing on it. Uh, I personally think a little longer is better. But, you know, maybe better to say no. 30 days. One other thing that, that um, people have to remember, some of the older pools that are getting remodeled, um, may not be bond, the equipment may not be bonded properly. And when you add a salt system to that, Mm -hmm. uh, it can, it can result in electrolysis of uh, any metal parts that are in, in the pool, whether it's a ladder, whether it's a rail, a light, uh, anything that's comes in contact with it, it will corrode over time if you do not have proper bonding. So, that would be um, one thing to remember is if you're going to sell a salt system on a remodel to make sure that you have proper bonding on all of the equipment. Yeah, it, it's 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 funny to me, you know, because they, it's not like this is new technology per se. I mean, these things, salt systems have, go, have gone back a long way. What's new is the the rapid popularity of them, which is honestly, I, I get it. It's a it's a great system when it's when it's installed properly and when it's used properly um, and maintained in its own specific way with the needs that that it that it it has with it. But I think we can all agree because of the homeowners desire to have a quote unquote chemical free pool. And for those of you that are not watching, I'm using the, the air quotes here, but people buy these and they say, I don't need chemicals. I have a salt pool. And, and we all know in the professional industry, this is just a recipe for disaster because these systems do have certain specific needs and requirements as far as the maintenance and the procedure that goes with them. So um, it, it's, it's a, an interesting phenomenon, but I think through education and discussion, um, whether it's just weekly maintenance of a pool that's salt or whether it's specifically when to you know, flip the switch on a, on a brand new pool with a fresh plaster finish that the homeowner or the builder has chosen to go with a salt system, how that all lines up, right? So let's just be aware, but we've got to break the notion of the chemical free pool because it is a salt pool. I mean, that's just still, yeah. it's yeah. 
And to Rob's point, if you educate the client up front as to what to expect, that, that alleviates a lot of the issues that may come at the back end. So, absolutely, you know, education, like yeah. you said, Chris, would... is important. Go ahead, Ken. Sorry. I was going to say, I always saw it wrong. Uh, you know, I always, the, salt, the overselling of the salt system is what I always saw when it first came out. I always, people, it was the Ronco of the pool industry. Set it and forget it. Yeah. <laughs> the Ronco P- food P- dehydrator. Yeah, yeah exactly. Oh, P- wow. It didn't matter. matter. It. It's, it, it did it all. You just, it was the greatest, latest thing. And, you know, it was eating up stone and it was doing all kinds of stuff because it was something people could sell. They sold it really well. But, uh, but one thing I wanted to share a quip that, you know, a guy that mentored me in plaster, and I have heard him tell a story a million times, maybe good for the homeowners to hear, you know, fresh plaster. If you go back to Renaissance or Sistine Chapel, that's fresco painting, right? So they put on fresh plaster and then they, they stained it. They used stains to create it. Look, the color's still there. <laughs> so that's what he did. The point is, you know, you got fresh plaster. Any, you know, you knock those metals out, as you guys have been mentioning. If you put the chlorine in too early and those metals bleed out, you know, that fresh plaster, it leaves in the pool, the stuff that's going to land. That's why it's so important to move that water, brush that pool. You know, that fresh plaster will take on anything that it can um, and, and remain if you're, if you're not on top of it. So that's a great analogy. I'd never, that. Like you say, the color's still there. Yeah. It, it's, it's <laughs> I don't remember that. <laughs> when, um, when, I'm, when I'm selling a remodel and, you know, they say the pool was gray once. It was a lot darker than this once upon a time. I said, wait until we start chipping it out. And you're going to see how dark the pool actually was. It, it, it looked like it was, uh, it was a dark gray pool or a medium gray pool. And it's it's been sitting here for 20 years. Ah, it's been great. You know, it doesn't have any problems other than it's lightened up. And you will see a eighth, a, a eighth of an inch, a whole eighth of an inch crust of, I don't know if, if it's, it's definitely scale and pigment that's been pulled out of it because the calcium is too low or water chemistry was off, whatever. Um, and and that's, that's right underneath it. And when I show them that little chip after the guys are done chipping, the, chipping things out, they're amazed at how far gone the finish has become, has, or the, the, how south it's, the finish has gone since that time, 10, 15 years of just absolute neglect over year, over year, over year of not taking care of the water chemistry. But for them, it was like, yeah, it's, this is great. This is, you know, it, it lasted me this long. You know, <laughs> it was, uh, um, it's, uh, uh, it's yeah. a testament to what Brent was saying, that the, the colors are still there just underneath a layer of soot, so to speak. Yeah, I I did an inspection on a pool in San Diego that uh, had pigment loss that came from calcium depletion, the fill water, to your point, Rob, of checking the fill water. it It was low on calcium, and the homeowner never did anything about it. He took care of the pool, and it went from blue to gray in six months, and we took a sample out and and did a side cut view of it with a with a microscopic camera and you could see the layers that you were talking about you can see the calcium layer you can see the layer of 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 the cement that has the depleted pigment and then down below you can see the true pigment still there and it's very clear so it's it it can disappear in a lot of different ways it can be masked over or it can just be leached out yeah, it's um, it's unbelievable how detrimental it can be, especially when you start using these different microscopes and and high high uh, detail cameras to really look at it. But just aesthetically, you know, I mean, it's like, oh, I, you know, over a year, my pool literally changed colors, but it was a little bit every day, and now I'm just used to it. I mean, we see that all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if a treatment's done, it revert, you know, it reverts back to what it really should have looked like. And some people are shocked, you know, it just looks so physically different. We get that as well. Um, another thing that we, I think we should discuss too, is just the popularity of different types of, of both robotic and water powered cleaners, as well as manual vac heads and how something is as, as benign sounding as vacuuming your pool or throwing in a pool cleaner can also have negative effects if it's not done in the proper cadence, uh, according to 
the startup process. So what, what can go bad there when it comes to vacuuming, whether it's manual or with a cleaner? Anything with wheels, uh, the pressure will push that dust down into the pores of the finish and, uh, it's pretty much going to stay there. And you're going to see these tracks back and forth across the pool. And they're very, very visible, of course, on a, on a dark finish because that's just the, the chalk and the chalkboard type of situation. Um, but you can actually see it on some of the, uh, the lighter colored finishes too, especially at night. People turn their pool light on and they just go bananas because there's these tracks all over the bottom of the pool. Right. Um, brush backing is, is, is the way to go in the beginning. And then, uh, they're always anxious to put the, the pool sweep in. And I just, I tell people, just wait. It, it, it's not worth taking the chance of getting any issues developed with it. So I tell them to wait 30 days. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think that's a good, that's a, that's a good practice anyway. Um, it just makes a lot of sense. And I think we've all seen that. And again, it could be a, a new homeowner that inherited the pool or it could be, you know, several scenarios, but we've all seen tracks from a wheeled cleaner <laughs> that, that just stick around a little too long. Oh, it, it's, it's uh, great. Hey, Rob, there, there's, there's some, there's, there's these weird stripes that are in my pool. What's, what, you know, what did you do to the finish? Yeah. Right, let me go check it out. Yep. All right, service company, weren't you, didn't you get the memo not to clean the pool after two weeks? Oh, but it was filthy. Still, yeah. you're not supposed to put a wheeled vacuum in here. You look at this thing. It's, it's, uh, it's a, it's a, I can't even tell you it's a nice look, you know, um, Oh, I always like dog paws and uh, footprints too. You know, the kids are in the pool. Oh, early. yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> we, we've we've all had, heard, those are my feet. <laughs> I don't know what, I don't know what it is with, with folks that just have to go down and walk in the pool before the water's in it. I don't, I don't understand it. Well, some oh, of the guys walk out with their socks on. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Their socks on, not bare feet. And here we go. Yeah. Yeah, there's all kinds. Well, of that's things. why I think this is important. I think that's kind of what we're talking about. There, you know, yeah. the industry's always—it's the check collector. Your water's clean. You can jump in, right? So there was a long time where even the, you know, I'm going to say the biller service industry—they want those people wanted to swim, and you wanted them to swim. You wanted to get that check. But I think that we've kind of slowed that down with the knowledge that we're we're trying to put out there that there is a process. This is cement. It's going through change. It's, it's got byproducts that we need to get out of there. Uh, there's things you have to do and, and, and in the long run, given it those, especially the first three days into the first two weeks, obviously to the first 30, but you know, just given it that first initial, a little bit of extra attention, I think that's what we really want everybody to know. It makes such a huge difference and it's really not difficult. You just might not have to, might not be able to get in there right away. Yeah. yeah. Here's something I want to bring up. We we didn't bring it up yet. Is is the actual filling of the swimming pool? You know, mm -hmm. We're talking about when the pool's full. Um, filling the pool is just as important as having a balanced water. And where I'm going is, uh, don't turn it off. Don't don't stop the pool from filling at any at, at, at any point. If you're filling by hose, you have to keep that hose on until the pool is full. If you're filling by truck, you have to keep a hose running in between. The, the loads of the truck yes. delivery, because what will happen, not if, could, what will happen is you'll see these lines form every time that the pool stops, uh, every time you turn that water, that, that hose off. Um, and you'll yep. get these layers and you can see the progression of the fill. Uh, and I, I've seen it where like they, they came in, they dumped the truck and uh, it took them an hour and a half to come back for another load. And you can see each, each layer of, low, <laughs> of, of water going all the way up the pool wall. That's a great I mean, point, that, Rob. That, yeah, that's a great that's thing just, to bring up. <laughs> that's yeah. just as important. I mean, if, and, and these are, we're trying to avoid scaling and, and other waterborne issues that, that happen. Uh, but the actual fill itself is, is, is extremely important. Um, you know, I, and I have, so Mr. Handy homeowner, when <laughs> when the guys leave the job and they do put like I have the Long Island is is notorious for filling by hose because trucking water in is just very expensive it's a big deal, um, so they'll leave the hose in the pool it may take two or three days to fill, sometimes and this just happened last week 
where the home, homeowner helped out. He decided to take another hose and put it right on top of the step. You know, we always fill the hole. We always fill the pool from the deepest part, which is the main, you know, the, the deep end by the main drain. And it fills up naturally that way. Well, he dropped the, the hose right on the top step and had this beautiful funnel going right down the center of the pool into the deep end. But guess what that's doing? It's hydrating wherever the water's hitting. It's hydrating that part, part of the, of the finish. And this guy is now going to have a permanent scar on that pool because that right where the water was running over the pool surface was hydrating differently than where it was dry. And, you know, thank God that wasn't our guys doing it. It, it was, it's on them, but you know, they helped, but they didn't help help at all. So you know, if you see the pool, the, the pool being filled at the deepest part of the pool, leave it there. Or if you're going to put a hose in it, put it in where the water is already, not let it run down, down the surface there. It could, it could leave a scar. Great point, Rob. And, and uh, you said earlier about testing fill water, same thing with trucked in water. I've seen trucked in water that was just absolutely awful and it ruined the pool. Um, so you need to test it, find out where they're getting it, test it, and make sure that they get it from the same source each time because if they can find it closer, they may stop somewhere and you'll have a different type of water being put into the pool. So. Uh, whatever goes in, you need to test it before it goes in so you're not in a reaction type of uh, situation. Yeah, testing validates everything. Just because it's trucked in, just because it's coming from a source and being sold, I can assure you it's not coming from the Evian factory or smart water's <laughs> plant. No, no. You know, so. you, get, you get into the, to the higher regions of, of, of uh, the mountains over here, and they're hitting a lake, and they're dropping the holes into the lake to fill, the, to fill their trucks up from, from there. So you're, you're subject to, you know, it's the ultimate groundwater in that sense, coming right out of a pond or a lake, what have you. I just hope you don't get any fish that go along with it. <laughs> and, there, and, and there you have it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah it's, it's, and that's exactly why, you know, arming and equipping yourself and becoming intimately familiar with these tried and true um, steps that are, are often audited and rechecked and, and updated as well. Um, when we're talking, you know, when we're talking about the, the startup process that, in, that is endorsed by the NPC, I mean, th there's other suggested ways to do it, but if there's really one body of people and one collective group in the industry that, that is going to, have the best practices to put down to advise it, it's this this is the piece that, that really you want to do um having said that and this is probably a segment for a whole the next episode or, or one soon um just discussing you know overall water balance when it comes to testing and specifically using the uh the saturation index you know the langolier saturation index which is we could talk about this for two hours, right? And there's so many different um, resources out there to help uh, use and, and calculate it, but, but understanding what it is and how it applies realistically and its purpose in this role, I, I think is something that, that we should probably discuss in depth on another episode, but briefly Kent, like, you know, when we're talking about LSI, you know, it's, it's basically an equilibrium model. Um, that it's a calculation that can they can put some parameters in place to help guide us to the overall balance of the water and a big you know a big backed out picture. But um, there's many factors. You know, calcium hardness is a huge factor in that. For example, also uh, you know alkalinity and, and et cetera, et cetera, including water temperature as well. But let's again, you know, this is a conversation most likely for another episode. But but let's touch on hardness and, and what are your opinions on it. Hardness is very important because uh, in certain areas, uh, you'll find that fill water is low in hardness and water is going to seek equilibrium. It's going to balance itself. And if you put calcium deficient water into a calcium rich environment as a new finish, it will pull calcium out. And what, what happens is that calcium is removed and water takes its place and you can, in, in a, like a white colored uh, plaster, no pigment, you're going to see a clouded effect where it's, you see gray clouds here and there. And uh, sometimes that can be remedied uh, with a torching, but it's, it's something to be avoided as yeah. Bob said, test your fill water. 
calcium, uh, that's what plaster is comprised of, different types of calcium. And uh, <clears throat> if you remove that, if you don't take care of the calcium level in the water and you allow the water to pull it out of the, the finish, it's going to shorten the life and also ruin the aesthetics of your finish. So it is very important to monitor that. And you need to check it at least once a month because what I found in running reverse osmosis trailers and going around different parts of California, looking at pools, water changes every day. It may have been uh, a hardness of 150 uh, six months ago, but now it's down at 120. Uh, with the influx of population to an area, uh, there's a greater demand on the water source and that aquifer is drawn down. So you'll get a different type of water coming out of the path. Um, mm -hmm. So it's important to check on it at least once a month when it's in the pool. Yeah, and it's, it's something that goes, you know, when we did, coming from a, a chemical, you know, a chemistry background as far as uh, being a chemical manufacturer, it's it's shocking to me how you know overlooked calcium is in, in many different facets of the industry, but it is very simple. I mean, to your point, Kent, if the water is soft, if it's lacking calcium and it's looking for its equilibrium, it's going to go find it. It's going to eat it up. It's going to pull. And if there's too much and it's beyond its capacity to where and it's out of the equilibrium on the other side, it has a tendency to deposit. And, and that can be ex, expedited by temperature, by chemistry. There's, there's many variables that can involve that. But essentially, it's all a factor of equilibrium and where the water wants to naturally be without depositing or pulling out. And another situation that, that is so often overlooked are homes that are equipped with a water softener. Oh, yeah. And they don't even realize it as well. And they're filling up from the hose and like, oh, yeah, well, my water, you know, my city water says this, but they're not factoring in that a lot of times a whole home's water source is going through a softener or brine system as well, which makes for very soft water. So, you know, again, test, validate, be aware, follow the procedure and the process on the card, and it's going to make your life as professionals and as homeowners much, much easier. I tell you, you know, cal calcium is, in my opinion, the most neglected um, equation in a balanced pool. Uh, I think um, because because of the infrequency of that you test it, uh, and how you know one day you can have a, a very high count. God forbid you have a leak with an autofill that could dilute it. Uh, to, especially with the soft water that that Chris was was um, talking about. I think also uh, when it comes to testing uh, the pools, it's what you use to test the chemistry is that just as important as testing it. I mean, I think if uh, you know, we're, we're test strips are great for a, a quick snapshot in time type type thing to get a, a range or a guide of, of where you're going. When you're, when you're balancing, keeping your pool in balance at the startup and, and the maintenance thereafter, it's really important to, to drive home exactly where your calcium hardness is. You know, you can't guess within a range because that range could be off and that's what test test strips do and some of them don't test specifically for calcium hardness they're they're calculating a bunch of different materials that like magnesium and, and such that, that are manganese and copper and all of that affects the the hardness of the pool but we're looking specifically for calcium hardness a, a drop test kit will get you there more accurately so i think it's real important to to use a proper test kit um when you're doing that yeah, I've but... got a better solution, I think. Okay. Find yourself an MPC certified startup technician. Indeed. There you go. There you go. Mm -hmm. And get yourself free of charge the startup card that's available at mpconline.org uh, and nationalposturecouncil.com. That's what we want our homeowners to do and our builders to do. And yes, absolutely go on those websites. Do the search for local certified guys. If you're a builder or a service guy, you know, come take one of our classes. It's going to be like I shared with you. Great that it's going to be coming out in an LMS format, you know, online course with testing and all that. And uh, and like I said, this is something we've brought, we've created for the industry. We've brought to the industry. It's important to us. It's important to, to the homeowners and the builders. And, uh, and, and, and we've got it 
wrapped up in a nice little neat package right now with people available to you and a card free of charge. You just have to enter some information and you can print that thing off. Um, I, I think it's been a great discussion, but I will say that that card really kind of brings it in on the, the front and back. You got day one, day two, you got, uh, you know, you got the LSI information there. It gives you little bits and pieces of that. It talks about the longevity of the pool. It talks about the first 30 days. It sounds like a lot, but it's all there. It's very concise. And if that doesn't work, Mr. Kent Westfall, he is our director of technical services. And you can always call him up and, and he'll talk to you for hours about the startup of your pool. Right, Kent? Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I uh, I take calls from all over and and um I tell people I said don't be afraid to ask any questions. You know, we're here to help. And we've got if you were to add up all of the years of experience that is accumulated in the people in the NPC, it would be mind-boggling. And I tell people learn from other people's mistakes. You know, we've we've made the mistakes. We've learned how to how to make the adjustments, how to take care of it. And, and we are here to help. So please don't, don't hesitate. If you have a question, give me a call. If I don't get back to you right away, be patient because I do get a lot of calls, but I will get back to you and uh, give you information that will help you through your problem. And uh, that's what we're all about, helping the people. Perfect. I think that where our signature is, this is a smooth finish. Don't forget to visit us online, npconline.org, nationalplasters.council.com, and go to our Facebook page, find us at the podcast. Uh, again, we've got this offered out to you guys everywhere. Chris, Rob, Ken, thank you so much. This was a great conversation, and I hope everybody enjoyed it. Go listen to some of our previous podcasts and get ready for the next ones. You can thank learn you guys. about reverse osmosis I, from Kent in one of our earlier ones there. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Hey, talk to you soon, everybody.